Picture this. You're scrolling around the Steam store, or whatever console store you use, oh, hell no. and come across a game you've never heard of. You watch the trailers and read the description, and all you can say is, Hey, you know, this reminds me of that other game. This is, most likely, a classic case of a game taking inspiration, whether it's trying to emulate a style or put a new spin on an existing concept. Which, considering how many games have been made, is pretty inevitable. When it comes to indie games, most tend to either expand on current trends or pay homage to older titles. Now this isn't inherently a bad thing, it just depends on how you do it. Take Dusk and Ultra Kill as examples, which add their own twists on the retro FPS genre made famous by Doom and Quake. Or how 4 player co-op games like Deep Rock Galactic and Killing Floor continue the legacy left behind by Left 4 Dead. Not to mention the countless Souls-likes, Roguelikes, and Metroidvanias which feel original because they often blend together as many genres as possible. Seriously, Roguevania? But inspiration is often defined by what a person grew up with. In my childhood, I fondly remember the N64, which had some absolute bangers that paved the way for many indie games as we know them. Games like Mario 64, Super Smash Bros., GoldenEye 007, Ocarina of Time, and Bassmasters 2000. Okay, maybe not that last one. But as a kid, there was one game on that console that drew me in like no other. Pokemon Snap. I was a huge fan of Pokemon, so to be able to see the creatures roaming around in 3D was mind-blowing. Plus, I could endlessly throw apples and pester balls at defenseless creatures who were just minding their own business, but I wanted to hurt, no, destroy all of them in my quest to become the top photographer. All so Professor Oak could say, Well done! However, for the longest time, despite its popularity, it didn't seem like there were going to be many games like it. That was until recently, when I was scrolling around the Steam store and stumbled upon a little known indie game that reminded me of Pokemon. And it starts with a P. That's right, I'm talking about Panko Park. What, you thought I was gonna talk about Pal World? I would never. Wait, don't look at that! Penko Park, however, is a small indie game developed by Ghost Butter and released in October of 2020. It's a creature collector photography game where you ride around in a cannon. I could already tell it was inspired by Pokemon Snap, not only because of its concept, but also because they showcased a review that basically said the same thing. And yes, it did have the unfortunate timing of being overshadowed by the release of Bandai Namco's actual sequel of Pokemon Snap, which honestly was pretty good. It brought back the original main character, had beautiful graphics and animations, but you couldn't stop your vehicle, so 0 out of 10. Now, Panko Park, that definitely oozes the same charm as the OG, while still looking wildly different. Um, I've played 30 hours of both the original Pokemon Snap and the new Pokemon Snap, and I can say with certainty that this game is- So, some people might think it looks weird, or is too similar in concept to Snap. But if we're talking about Pokemon, I feel like there are more egregious examples. Plus, I feel like it's more appropriate to call it a Snap-like game. And to Penko Park's credit, in 2018, during its development, it was originally called Magnificent Monsters and was a free roam picture game, before they changed it to be on rails. And like the original, it even has a forest level and a volcano level, and has almost identical items. And while it wears that influence on its sleeve, it still provides an immersive experience with fun mechanics, plenty of secrets to unlock, and the exploration of a now abandoned wildlife park full of whimsical creatures that have a completely unique art style and presentation. Those creatures are called Pankos. Bet you never would've guessed that one. For the most part, these Pankos are cute and sometimes wacky 2D characters that live and breathe in these low-poly 3D environments. But what exactly are Pankos? Well, they're not like your average creatures. They're a bit... mysterious. Some of them are just animals like Pokemon, some are parts of the environment itself, and some are... uh... Mama. Whoa, what was I saying? Oh yeah, the art director, Eleanor Kopka, uses her staticky shading to give the illusion of 3D. Along with this, the Penkos are always facing your camera, or sorry, the Penko Snap-a-Lot 9000. So even as the perspective changes, the 2D models don't feel like they're floating PNGs. Although you mostly see them face to face, you sometimes get to see the other side of Penkos too. Oh. Overall, Penkos have a wide range of personalities. For example, you got crazy fellows like Robertus, little sleepy guys like Goomer, oh, I just said Groomer. <laughs> cautious individuals like Norel, and then you got Doug. Oh, it's Doug, but he's dancing Doug. Is dancing dog. And of course, we have our tour guide, Panky, 
while she's one of many Penkies, which seems to be a more intelligent species than most Penkos. She also acts as the Professor Oak of this game, judging our photos on a star rating from 1 to 3. We'll go with this one here. What do you mean, mmm? Just like its predecessor, taking good pictures is all about timing. The criteria for what makes a good photo is relatively the same as Snap. Make sure they're towards the middle, take up most of the frame, and aren't obstructed by the environment. But the main difference is that Snap used this point system to determine how good a photo was, whereas Penko Park just says, yeah, that's good, eh, could be better, and- Wow. That's fucking disgusting. What qualifies a picture into your scrapbook is shown through icons as you hover over a Penko. Some require them to feel a bit quirky, haha, very silly. While others require you to either wait patiently for them to change poses, yes, or use items. When you level up, you unlock new stamps, which offer different abilities and gadgets like the Penko Balls, which I think are made of flowers, but considering that the park used certain Pengos to build fences, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know. But they basically act the same as the pester balls from Snap, either angering Penkos. Okay, calm down, bro. Making them bust it down. Oh. 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 Or leaving them completely unfazed. Also similar to Snap, hitting certain Penkos causes a little chain reaction that you can see later on in the course. An item you get later on, and my personal favorite, is the Penko Wand. Okay, I know this looks like a copy paste of the Pokey Flute, but you're wrong. It's actually just an ocarina. But it is really cool that each level has its own unique song. In order to actually know the correct sequence, you have to explore and look around for these boards. When you do use one of the tunes, it often reveals hidden items and penkos, or makes them act up. Go crazy. The last, or really first item you get, is the Penko Grappling Hand. See, there is something original here. With this, you can grab various artifacts related to the Penkos to place into your scrapbook. You can also use it to fetch these little loot boxes that give you a random hat for Penky to wear. Ah, a tour guide after my heart. Another use of the hand is to reach these white signs, which give you ghost of vision and allows you to see all the Penkies that were fired indefinitely. However, probably the most important use for the grappling hand is reaching levers that unlock new paths. Pretty early on, you unlock the ability to put your turn signal on and change directions. This is so you can explore new areas and discover Penkos that you might have seen in the distance, but now you can reach. In the original Snap, there would really only be one set path, but you would be able to open up new levels by interacting with certain Pokemon. But if I were to put away my rose-tinted lenses for a second, while the game definitely had some iconic set pieces, some of the environments themselves could be barren, to say the least. On the flip side, Penko Park has fantastic environmental storytelling with so much detail in the various structures and foliage in each level. This often reveals how Penkos live and thrive in their environments. Another way the game gives information is after you discover a Penko. Its description, essentially its Pokedex entry, tells us a little tidbit about him. Like Slonko, which states, where there is a hole, there is a Slonko. I don't really like what that implies. Or Crob, which, oh, is a quote from a Penko Park scientist. Well, let's see what they have to say. Its timid appearance makes me want to examine its innards even more. Yeah, we're just gonna put that in the down bad pile. Back to the paths, in the water level, there's a locked gate, which once you get through, allows Penkos that were previously just floating around to finally give you the pose you were looking for. Exploring further in, there's even little floaty guys that explode when threatened. But it's fine, they respawn. Right? One of the last paths you unlock is in the ice level, where you enter the Shivering Crypts. This is where the creepy part of that review comes into play. I mean, the rest of the game before this was pretty cute and lighthearted, but when you have possessed pankies, weird skulls, and stuff like this, it scares me. But the one thing that really caught me off guard was how it revealed some crucial information on the game's lore. Believe it or not, the lore to this game is pretty insane. Okay, well maybe not that. Oh. So apparently, we learned that the park was founded by a guy named Sir Robertus Penko. Hey, wait a minute! Who had captured the original Penky Sages so he could use them and the various Penko species that worshipped them as tourist attractions. With their help, he eventually found and locked up the legendary creature, Earl Penky, and created the Great Earl Penky Show. This was the beginning of the end of Penko Park, which might have had something to do with the overpriced tickets. Before we get into that, I should let you know that Robertus is kind of a freak. For example, when he started to use Penkies to assist with park errands, he realized their potential and made a breeding station just for them. Wow. The length some people will go for power. 
Also, in those descriptions I mentioned earlier, some of them are just quotes from Robertus himself. Banky workers hardly feel the cold. And even if they did, I wouldn't want to hear about it. I don't care what came first. If the people want omelette, we will serve them. Moving your body like a sweaty pearl. It's irresistible. Simply put, the man is a menace. Luckily, we're able to end his reign of terror as we head to the final level. The last stamp we unlock is the Great Colosseum, represented by a crown which was foreshadowed by the first Penka Wan song we ever learned. There, we circle around the Great Earl Penky Show, or what's left of it. Man, this place fell off. In the middle, we see the creature that had been locked up for all these decades. After pelting it with balls for a bit, we remove the shackles one by one with rock bombs? Look, I don't know where they're getting this artillery from, but I'm all for it. And finally, we free Earl Penky from his shackles, along with some ghost Penkies, and we see them fly up to the great Penko Park in the sky. But more importantly, our Penky got a brand new hat! You come stains, nothing wrong with that. Honestly, this last level was a bit underwhelming. I think it could have done with the Robertus cameo, personally. But just like Mew from Snap, they foreshadowed Earl Penke's appearance throughout the game, culminating in a weird fever dream of a final level. Especially because the tour guide Penke, who flew up with the rest of them, just comes back to help us finish the game as if nothing ever happened. That being said, I think the lore being as wacky as it is, perfectly encapsulates the chaotic nature of this game. All in all, while Penko Park definitely takes some inspiration gameplay-wise from Pokemon Snap, it does a great job in making a brand new world full of hilarious and sometimes creepy characters that I won't soon forget. It also fills that nostalgia-shaped hole in my heart that was left empty for all these years. And really, the game's wit and charm make it all the more enjoyable to sit down for a weekend of light-hearted fun. If any of you are still here, Happy New Year! Psst, that's your cue. <sighs> Thanks for watching, and have a great 2024.